Amelia Earhart blazed a trail across the sky and left a comet tale of awe and inspiration. Her signature move? Oh, just casually zipping across the Atlantic Ocean, all alone, a feat only a person with nerves of steel could pull off. And if that wasn't enough, she whipped out another first, the inaugural solo flight from tropical Hawaii to the mainland US. However, one day, Amelia vanished during an audacious attempt to circle the entire globe in her trusty plane. Despite extensive searches, neither she nor her aircraft were ever found. Amelia's vanishing act turned into one of the most enduring whodunits of the 20th century. Now, let me tell you a bit more about the hero of our story. For starters, she came from the picturesque Kansas town of Atchison, but what made her truly special from a young age was the fact that she liked to break social molds. She liked to play basketball and tinker with cars. In between her adrenaline-filled exploits, Amelia served as a nurse's aide in Toronto. There, she started hanging around local airfields, probably trying to pick up some flying tips from the local pilots. Returning to the U.S., Amelia dipped her toes in pre-med at Columbia University, but traded her textbooks for a pilot's jacket after a thrilling airplane ride with a veteran pilot in 1920. That was the hook. Amelia became irreversibly smitten with the sky. Learning to fly was no small feat, but Amelia was up for the challenge. She enrolled for flying lessons soon after. To fund her high-flying dreams, Amelia got down to earth, slogging away as an administrative clerk in the city of Los Angeles. After scrimping and saving, she finally bought her own set of wings, a bright yellow plane, which she lovingly dubbed the Canary. After her flight test in 1921, she managed to snatch her first flight exhibition, wowing the crowds in Pasadena, California. When it came to setting records, Amelia was a master. She flew solo at amazing heights, a feat no woman had achieved before at that time. Next, she made a solo transatlantic flight, making landfall in a cow field in Northern Ireland. Despite her individual success, Amelia wasn't one to hog the limelight. She actively worked to bring more women into aviation. For this, she co-founded an organization dedicated to the promotion of female pilots. Today, this group still champions women in aviation across 44 countries. By 1937, Amelia was itching for another adventure. She planned a spectacular eastbound flight around the world, aiming to be the first pilot to pull off this celestial showstopper. Taking off from Oakland, California, she aimed to encircle the globe like a hawk circling its prey. This time she had a sidekick, a navigator named Fred Noonan. The duo blazed a trail from Miami to South America, across the Atlantic to Africa, then to India and Southeast Asia. A tragedy struck. Amelia and Fred never made it to one of their refueling stops at Howland Island. Their last radio contact with the U.S. Coast Guard was enigmatic, to say the least. After U.S. officials greenlit a massive search, the world waited. Sadly, after two weeks of suspense, Amelia and Fred were declared lost at sea. Ever since countless theories have bubbled up about their fate, the official verdict is that the pair were lost in the Pacific Ocean. This theory suggests they finished up all their fuel while searching for Howland Island and plunged into the vast ocean. Over the years, various well-equipped expeditions have tried to locate the wreckage near Howland, but alas, the ocean isn't spilling the beans. There's another intriguing theory, the Gardner Island Hypothesis. Some folks reckon Amelia and Fred landed on Gardner Island, now named Nikumaroro, in the Republic of Kiribati, which was a long distance off their course. Though search planes saw signs of recent activity on the island a week after Amelia's disappearance, they found no trace of the plane. This theory, however, strongly suggests that Amelia and Fred ended up as castaways on the island and eventually met their end there. Some evidence supporting this includes artifacts like a piece of plexiglass, a woman's shoe, improvised tools, and a cosmetics jar from the era, even some suspicious bones. But despite expeditions and sniffing border collies, no conclusive proof has emerged. Now, what do Godzilla-sized crabs have to do with Amelia Earhart's disappearance? It turns out that these quirky creatures might possibly hold the keys to one of history's greatest unsolved mysteries. These ginormous creatures, the coconut crabs, would make you think twice before you dismiss anything as too large. They tip the scales at a whopping nine pounds and can stretch out to a startling three feet. To put it simply, they make your average pug look like a snack. This theory takes us back to that tiny island in the Pacific where Amelia supposedly made a pit stop but left no trace, Nikumaroro. 
When people went looking for clues regarding the famous aviator's disappearance, one rule was drilled into their thoughts. Watch out for those monster crabs. Their pincers can really pack a punch. By day, our explorers could easily steer clear of these hard-shelled creatures. They'd find the crabs lounging under the lush coconut palms, or maybe enjoying the breeze among the branches of the trees. Yes, you heard right. These critters are also good at climbing. But when the sun sets, well, that's when things get crabby. Those courageous explorers quickly learned that sleeping off the ground was essential unless they fancied a late-night claw massage. You see, these jumbo crabs are like the leading actors in this theory about what happened to our heroine Earhart and her navigator. According to this hypothesis, when the aviators missed their mark at Howland Island, they improvised a landing strip on Nikumaroro's reef. The plane eventually wandered off. Planes do that sometimes, you know. Leaving Earhart alone on the island. Well, alone except for our mighty crustacean friends. By the 1940s, people had set up shop on the island and a chap unearthed some bones. However, he managed to find only 13 of them out of a possible 206. The total amount of bones in a human body. So, where did the rest of them go? You guessed it. Our robber crabs might have fancied a little midnight toy. Evidence indicates that the crabs have a tendency to clean up the island by dragging stuff back to their cozy burrows. Over the years, multiple experiments have been conducted to verify if these crabs have a peculiar hobby of bone collecting. In one such study, they introduced some bones to the island and kept their eyes peeled. Within a fortnight, the crabs had made a buffet out of it. In another exciting chapter, our researchers brought dogs from the Canine Forensics Foundation to give the area around a wren tree a good sniff. The dogs had earlier indicated that someone had kicked the bucket there. Despite their best efforts, they couldn't find any bones, but they're still hopeful. After all, if history has taught us anything, it's to never give up. These theories at least have some science to back them up. But as with many famous disappearances, there are also juicy ones. Was Amelia captured by someone? Were she and Fred secret spies who returned to the US under new identities? One of the craziest theories was neatly packaged in a book called Amelia Earhart Lives. The author put pen to paper and argued that our beloved Lady of the Skies didn't just vanish into thin air. Instead, she pulled a Houdini. And here's where things get extra zesty. According to this book, Amelia was nabbed by a foreign government. Thankfully, US officials came to her rescue. After a heroic effort, they transported her into the most clandestine relocation program ever. Her new identity? She transformed into a mysterious suburban housewife under the name Irene Bolam. But, as with all good stories, there was a twist. The hiccup was that Irene Bolam was already out there, living her life and probably whipping up a mean meatloaf in her suburban kitchen when she got wind of her new identity as a repackaged Amelia Earhart. Obviously, Irene wasn't too thrilled about this revelation, so she lawyered up and took a stand against the claims, vigorously denying this shocking identity swap. You're out hiking along a highway surrounded by rainforest. There are no cars here, so all you hear is silence. The sky is thick with clouds. Now it starts raining heavily. As the first drops fall to the ground, you can hear a strange clicking light sound coming from far away. The rainforest seems to have come to life. The bushes and tree branches are slightly trembling. It feels like an earthquake. At this moment, the red crabs start running out of the forest. It looks like a red blanket moving towards the road. This blanket consists of hundreds of millions of red crabs. This phenomenon occurs every year on Christmas Island in Australia. Crabs fill all the roads. It's impossible to move my car or foot at this time. It's like a huge stream of a river that demolishes everything in its path. About 100 million crabs are trying to achieve their main goal in life – to reach the shore alive. For most of their lives, red crabs hide in burrows, in deep crevices of rocks. They stay there for almost a whole year, eating fruits, berries, fallen leaves, and other organic things. They try to live in damp, dark places to keep their body moist. Then the dry season ends. In October or November, when the rainy season starts, the crabs come out of their houses and make a journey of several days. They are guided not only by the rain. They come out of their burrows at a certain phase of the moon. A little later, you'll find out why they need it. In several days, male and female crabs migrate to the coast of the Indian Ocean. And now they are finally in place. Here, they produce their offspring. 
all males begin to dig deep burrows on the shore. In these holes, the females will hatch their eggs. When the male crabs finish their job and pits are ready, they go back to the rainforests. The females begin to hatch the eggs. It takes 12 to 13 days. Then the crabs take their eggs and bring them to the water. They reach the shore and release their eggs into the water. The phase of the moon now plays an important role. The moon creates an indirect tide, making it milder than usual. This helps to give the offspring a better chance of survival. The eggs of the red crabs have hatched, and small larvae move to the sea. Within a month, they go through several stages of development and take the form of a tiny transparent crab, similar to a shrimp. These tiny creatures are called megalopae. They accumulate in puddles near the shore in this shrimp form. There, they grow the first layer of shell and go deep into the land to look for a safe place. They grow up and wait for the rainy season to run back to the shore and produce offspring. To keep the crabs safe, people close roads in those places where migration occurs. Welcome to the French island of Réunion, located in the Indian Ocean, 430 miles east of Madagascar. The magnificent shore, a stunning coral reef, golden sands, and green jungle. For a long time, this island was considered one of the best places for surfing. But then, it turned into one of the most terrible and dangerous places on Earth. And sea creatures are to blame. Throughout the island, you can see signs saying that swimming and surfing outside the Coral Lagoon are prohibited. This island has become famous all over the world because of the frequent shark attacks. You can dive into the water near the island and immediately feel like prey. From afar, you notice several fins. They belong to some of the most aggressive and dangerous sharks in the world, bull sharks, and they are approaching you. In the beginning, it may seem they are slow, but they deliberately create the illusion of sluggishness to make the prey relax. At the right moment, they become agile and fast. They are called bull sharks because of their short, flat face, similar to a bull. Their bodies are strong and tough. These predators like to push their heads and hit their prey or other sharks with their noses. From the 80s to the present day, more than 50 shark attacks on humans have been recorded. During this time, the probability of a shark attack on a person has increased almost 23 times. Scientists still don't know the exact reason for these incidents. It's possible the number of sharks has increased, leading to a lack of food. Therefore, sharks eat anything and see people as lunch. Another theory says the water temperature has changed, and sharks feel comfortable swimming in this region. But the most interesting hypothesis is related to the volcano. Réunion is a volcanic island. Because of the ground fluctuations, large parts of the rock fall from the slope of the volcano end up in the ocean. This makes the water cloudy, and such conditions are ideal for marine predators. No, I'm not swimming there. The next island we're going to visit also looks peaceful, but is way more dangerous than Shark Island. We're moving to Brazil. The small green island is located 25 miles off the coast of this country. There are no people here. It seems completely uninhabited at first glance. However, you can see traces of modern humans, the old lighthouse. It's been abandoned for a long time. Sometimes the Coast Guard comes to the lighthouse to check if everything is okay and if there are no strangers on the island. People are forbidden to set foot in here for their own good. The only inhabitants of the island are snakes. This piece of land is home to about 4,000 species of these reptiles. They hang on trees and crawl on the ground. Snakes have no enemies in their home, and they feed only on birds that visit the island for recreation during a long flight. But the worst thing is, these snakes are some of the most venomous in the world. Oh boy! The golden lancehead vipers are unique species that live only in this place. Snake Island was once part of the mainland of Brazil, but 10,000 years ago, the sea level rose, separated this place, and turned it into an island. The animals that lived here were completely isolated. For thousands of years, all living creatures were displaced by poisonous reptiles. Their poison wasn't developed immediately in the body. Evolution has given them this to hunt birds. They can catch prey with one bite. There is a legend that a pirate arrived on the island a long time ago to hide a treasure. He put the chest in the depths of the island and settled snakes here so they would scare away anyone who wanted to find the treasure. Hey, works for me. We're moving to Southeast Asia. Ramri Island is located near the coast of Myanmar. 
This place was especially dangerous in the first half of the 20th century. The island is covered with dense forests and swamps. This wet place is ideal for a saltwater crocodile. This animal can reach 23 feet in length, nearly twice as long as a passenger car. Hey, you want to take a ride on this croc? <laughs> Be my guest. And they can weigh nearly 2,000 pounds. These monsters are hiding among swamps and trees. You may not even notice them. At some point, they will come out and attack you. The exact number of crocodiles that lived on this island was unknown, but it was definitely a big number. Any living creature that enters their territory is regarded as food. Currently, the crocodile population on this island has decreased. It's not known whether there are any reptiles here at all anymore. Let's finish our journey on an island where animals are happy to see you. The unofficial name of this place is Pig Beach. It's located in the Bahamas. The island is inhabited by cute pigs. They sunbathe on the beach, walk through the jungle, and ask for food from tourists. But the coolest thing is that they can all swim perfectly. You can stay in a hotel on a nearby island, rent a boat, and come to visit the pigs. It's not known exactly where the pigs came from. According to one of the legends, they survived a shipwreck and swam to the island. In addition to pigs, you can also meet cats and goats there. But most folks come to meet Porky and his friends. You can find many picturesque lakes in Louisiana. But one of them stands out among all the others. This deep lake is calm and beautiful. But its origin is closely connected with the story of a large-scale disaster that changed the entire ecosystem. A catastrophe that people managed to miraculously survive. And this disaster happened because of a mistake of just one person. To discover the incredible history of Lake Pinor, let's move back in time to more than 40 years ago. So it's 1980, early morning of November the 21st. Several workers start their shift. They continue searching for oil. A drill on an oil rig in the middle of the small Lake Pinor is an important part of this process. The depth of this lake is about 11 feet. If a grown-up person stands on its bottom and raises their hands, their fingers will reach the surface of the water. Everything goes without problems at first, but then the drill stops. It seems to have jammed at the bottom. Workers try to free the drill, but they can't do it. The engine gets overloaded, and people hear a few pops coming from below. At this moment, the entire rig begins to lean toward the water. The workers on the platform realize that something terrible is happening, so they run to the shore. A strong rumble comes next. The colossal $5 million drilling rig, with a height of a 15-story building, is slowly sinking into the water. But the lake's depth is no greater than a one-story building. How is it possible? Imagine the water leaving your bathtub through the drain hole. The same thing is happening to the lake now. The drill has punched a small hole in the walls of a salt mine, whose tunnels run through the rock under the lake. And now, millions of gallons of water are pouring into these tunnels. The created pressure is 10 times as great as that in a fire hydrant stream. The miners find out about the disaster. While the water is flooding the tunnels, they're trying to evacuate from the mine. 50 people are making their way through the water and mud using mine carts. A slow elevator can only lift eight people at a time. It takes seven approaches to evacuate all the miners. Can you imagine how the people at the end of the line feel? The devastating flood is behind you, and several dozen people and one slow elevator are ahead. Fortunately, all the people manage to escape. The water displaces the air from the mine, compressing it. First, it breaks through all the tunnels, and then it comes out from the ground in the form of geysers. But the disaster doesn't end there. A large funnel forms in the middle of the lake. The hole is expanding, pulling more water inside. The land around the lake begins to crumble and fall into the mine. Along with the soil, the funnel pulls in 11 barges, a tugboat, the entire oil platform, and many trees. The whole beach around the lake disappears. There's so much water in the salt cave that the direction of the flow of the nearest river changes. Now, not only the lake, but also the water from the surrounding area is flooding the mine. 
The funnel is expanding. From the side, you can see the formation of a massive waterfall with a height of 164 feet. This is the height of a 16-story building. At this moment, it's the highest waterfall in Louisiana. Fortunately, the destruction doesn't last long. Two days have passed. The mine is completely flooded. The funnel has disappeared. The water calms down. Several days ago, it was a shallow lake. Now it has a new bottom, located at a depth of 200 feet. This changes the ecosystem forever. New species of fish and animals appear there. The drilling company paid a fine of $45 million to compensate for the damage to all flooded enterprises. Of course, people investigated the cause of this disaster. It turned out that the engineer made a mistake in the maps. He used incorrect calculations to select the drilling coordinates and got to the salt mine. There is another lake with a huge funnel inside, and it's also artificial. But this time, people created it on purpose. Welcome to California, to Lake Berryessa. Previously, there was a small farming town of Monticello near the lake. In the last century, people built a dam here. But during the rainy season, the water level in the lake rose and poured over the dam's edges. Water flooded the land and washed away roads. You need to make the dam even higher to solve the problem, right? This is quite logical, but the town's engineers thought of something better. They dug a hole near the lake and covered its insides with concrete. It looks like a wide circular tunnel leading into the ground. During the rainy season, the level of the water rises high enough to reach the pit, and millions of gallons of water pour into it. It resembles a giant drain hole in the bathroom. All the water entering the hole travels through a horizontal tunnel and gets into the nearest bay. This is an effective and practical invention and an excellent attraction for many tourists. Skateboarders also like to hang out here. When the water level is low, they gather at the bay, near the place where the water flows out. The round tunnel is an excellent playground for skateboarding. We're moving to the desert of Yemen. There, we're also looking for a hole, but without a lake this time. This hole, the size of a basketball court, is in the middle of the desert. Scientists still don't know what's at the bottom of the hole or what formed it. But the locals are sure this pit is a portal to the underground world where evil spirits live. Even if you don't believe in all this, the giant hole in Yemen can still scare you. Sometimes, strange, frightening sounds come from the depth of this black abyss. And there's always an unpleasant smell of rotten eggs wafting out of there. The hole is so dark it absorbs sunlight. You won't see anything, even if you point a flashlight inside. People have studied this place with the help of powerful optical lenses and drones, but they couldn't see anything except the frightening darkness. From a distance, this place looks like a blob of black paint in the middle of a golden sandy canvas. Even now, the giant hole in Yemen is one of the most poorly studied and mysterious places on Earth. But recently, a group of brave people got down to its bottom. They found stalactites, snakes, and even waterfalls there. Scientists are trying to figure out how the hole appeared and how old it is. Some say that the hole was caused by construction works when geologists were drilling the soil in search of minerals. The drilling process made the surface of the ground collapse. And now let's visit another famous hole hidden under a huge amount of water. It's the Mariana Trench. This is the deepest pit on Earth, located in the Western Pacific Ocean near the Mariana Islands. It's so deep, it can fit one and a half Everests. To dive to the bottom, you need special equipment that can withstand intense water pressure. It should be a sturdy bath escape with an ample supply of oxygen. It's expensive, but the trip is worth it. In the Mariana Trench, you can meet unique, strange creatures you will never see on the surface or in some other region of the ocean. Toxic crayfish and microorganisms feeding on a substance that looks like oil live here. You can meet fish with transparent bodies and see their organs and skeleton. Creepy, toothy monsters similar to anglerfish can swim by. These creatures seem fragile and harmless. But look at yourself. 
We are inside a bath escape made of alloys of several metals. Water pressure can turn an ordinary car into flatbread here. And these fish with transparent bodies swim as if they're just hanging